everything underneath a particular element of our matrix and do this inductively until we get something up or triangular. And each time we do this, it's going to be uh, using one of these reflection matrices, which we know is orthogonal. Right? So in the end, what happens? <coughs> well, remember when we're done with this process, we get something upper triangular, we'll call that R. And we did that by reflecting over a bunch of different vectors V. And of course, we know that the inverse of an orthogonal thing is just this transpose. Right? Why do you know that, by the way? We know uh, right, Q transpose Q equals I. Yeah? And what is the definition of the inverse of a matrix? It's the thing that you multiply it by to get the identity matrix. So we know that Q inverse is equal to Q transpose. Right. So in other words, to get the Q from our QR factorization, we just multiply the transposes of all these guys that we wrote down. Easy. In fact, and we'll come back to this in just a moment, if our matrix A has not too many columns and a lot of rows, right, then this matrix Q is going to be very large. Right? Because it's going to be rows by rows, if you think about it. And so one way that we can store Q implicitly is by just storing a list of these vectors B. Right? So this is a much shorter list, sequel the number of columns. In fact, let's think about why that is. So we have two strategies for doing QR. Right? We have Gram Schmidt and we have Householder. But in fact, I kind of hit something under the rug when I told you about this, right? So what did Gram Schmidt do? He took A <coughs> and he post multiplied a bunch of times with a bunch of column operations until you got uh, something orthogonal. Right? So what is the size of Q? Well, it's the size of A, right? Because I took A and I post multiplied a bunch of times by, by square matrices. So in the end, Q is M by N, just like A is, and R is a bunch of products of upper triangular things. So they're all N by N, uh, just square elimination matrices. But when I did householder stuff, remember I was pre-multiplying by these orthogonal things. And if you look back at our expression for h sub v, this guy here, he's square. Right? So in this case, I was pre-multiplying by a bunch of m by m things and leaving a on the right-hand side. Right? The a turns into this upper triangular thing, and he remains m by m. Right? So these are two different matrices, or two different slightly different sized things. So let's say that I'm solving a very overdetermined system of equations. Right? So, so remember what this means? I do, I do uh, AX approximately equals B, but there's a ton of rows and not very many columns. What's going to happen if I run householder? All right, how big is Q going to be? Huge. Huge. Right? Mm -hmm. Because every single Q is a product of a bunch of square orthogonal matrices each of which is size proportional to the number of rows of A. Right? So if I want to solve a least squares problem where in reality I'm just solving for like four numbers, I'm still going to get this Q matrix which is ginormous in the process because it's equal to the number of samples in my least squares problem rather than my number of variables. That's not such a good thing. Hmm. And so, so, in fact, this is a very common case and something that we need to worry about a lot. I need to worry about a lot. And you do too. So how are we going to do this? Well, again, what we really want is the stability of this householder method, right? You'll notice the householder method really doesn't end up dividing by zero <laughs> quite as much as uh, Gram-Schmidt does, if you go back through the steps that we did. But we want the shape of Gram-Schmidt, right? Gram-Schmidt had this nice compact form for that least squares problem. So how can we do that? Well, let's take a look at R. Remember, R is upper triangular, but he's not necessarily square anymore. But what do we know about R beneath the, 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 the upper sort of square? It's completely zero. Right? Because by definition, an upper triangular matrix is one that has non-zeros only above the diagonal. But the diagonal smashes into the right wall of R pretty quickly, and then un everything underneath has got to be zero. Right? So remember what I was talking about at the beginning of the lecture today, when we discussed sparse matrices. What do we want to do when we have a ton of zeros in our matrix? We want to just not store them. <laughs> it's uh, as simple as that, right? So in particular, we can do a, construct something called the reduced QR factorization, where we say that really the R that we get out of running householder looks like R1 and then a bunch of zeros, where R1 is square and upper triangle. Yeah? Does this make sense? And then what we'll do is we'll take Q, we'll take the columns of Q and just partition them in the same way, 
And if you just do this product out, what do you get? Well, you really just get Q1 times R1 because the R2 uh, is zero. Yeah? So in fact, what you can get away with when you do uh, Q fact QR factorization with one of these orthogonal rotation or, or reflection methods is you simply keep track of the upper part of R and this part of Q while you're doing your factorization and you throw away the rest. This is called the reduced QR factorization and it's the size that you want. By the way, if you have a matrix that's really wide and not very tall, you might want to do the opposite of this, right? Um, in in Gram-Schmidt, for example. But we haven't really worried about that case a lot. So anyway, that's actually our complete story of QR factorization, modulo the stupid math mistake I made, which, you know, my bad. And uh, so the idea here is that now we have, we're starting to develop this whole sort of pantheon of different things that we can do to matrices, right? We have uh, LU factorization, we have Cholesky, we have QR, we have, um, well, that's about it. And, and, and we're going to develop some more in linear algebra. And, and this is sort of the pattern, right? Is when we want to solve A x equals B, obviously the matrix that matters the most is A. And if we can analyze the heck out of A and understand its structure, then we can hope to do better when we solve the original system of equations, or least squares, or so on. Okay, so uh, today is Monday, right? So on Wednesday, we'll get started with eigenmethods. In fact, my favorite, favorite eigenmethod basically is a one-liner past this, where you say, you factor a matrix as QR, and you replace that matrix with RQ, and then you factor that matrix as QR, and you replace that with RQ, and you just iterate that. You should try this in MATLAB at home. And what you'll find is what comes out is a diagonal matrix of all your eigenvalues, and a matrix of all your eigenvalues. Well, something just really does for me. So I'll let you puzzle over why that might be the case. And over the next few minutes, I'll let you figure out. Can somebody get the look on camera? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think so. Push that.